Welcome to Rooting For You, a seasonal gardening podcast for non-experts. I'm Tess and I know nothing. And I'm Elise and I know some things. Each week we'll chat about one gardening topic and then discuss the effort reward payoff by asking, is the juice worth the squeeze? Just a heads up, there might be a bit of swearing in this episode. You've been warned. If you ever go to Elise's place for a chilled dinner, chances are what's on the menu will be whatever's ready in the garden. A while back now, pre-lockdown, we had quite frankly some of the most delicious roast potatoes and a simple salad of lettuce and tomatoes. But let me tell you about the salad. We chucked on a few edible flowers and all of a sudden it looked bloody spectacular. And I've always thought of edible flowers as a bit fancy. Pastries, cakes, master chef. But just picking a few from the garden was just so simple and it looked spectacular. This use of edible flowers was a real game changer for me. So Elise, tell us, what do we need to know about growing our own edible flowers? Oh, I'm so glad that that meal was so memorable for you, Tess, because I just... <laughs> Like someone comes to my house as, you know, somewhat of a cook and I present them potatoes, tomato and lettuce. (laughs) It doesn't sound (laughs) overly spectacular, but you're so right that the edible flowers is just such a way to take a dish from zero to hero, both in both in aesthetics and flavor and just interest. So I'm really excited about this episode and edible flowers are particularly easy to grow. So there's really no reason why everyone can't give this one a crack. Now, I just want to say for starters that today I want to focus on the annual edible flowers. These are the uh, hard and fast edible flowers, not the perennial. Here for a good time, not a long time. Exactly. (laughs) These are not the stay in the ground all year round perennials. We will, I'm sure, do an episode on them in the future. So my favorite annual edible flowers are nasturtiums, pansies, violas, calendula, marigold, and corn flowers. Tess, do you know what any of them look like? Nasturtiums I have growing on your recommendation, so they were put in this spring. Fabulous. Um, they They have sprouted, but I don't have any flowers on those ones yet. I wouldn't expect so, no. <laughs> Excellent. And then the others are eluding you at this point? Oh, like they're vague. I mean, cornflowers are blue, they like, are, I assume, because yes. the color yeah, <laughs> it comes from the color or the other way around. Um, no, I didn't really know any of the others. <laughs> well, they're all very beautiful. But if we're going to talk the kind of the colors or the tones in the garden, the nasturtiums, calendula and marigolds are often in creams, yellows, oranges and red tones. So if that suits mm-hmm. your style or the cornflowers, pansies and violas are usually in white, yellow, pink, blue, red and black tones. So Ooh. so it's kind of the two opposing sides of the color spectrum. I like to have a mix of both, but depending on what you're going for in the garden. Mm. Now, with all these edible flowers, that by the way, there are actually heaps more flowers that you can eat other than the list that I've got here but I've focused on these because they're really common ones which means they're easy to source in seed and seedling and they're really easy to grow so get Mm. started with this list now with all these the flowers themselves are the edible parts that's hence the name of the episode but (laughs) but the fun thing about nasturtiums and this is why they're my absolute number one edible flower pick is you can also eat the leaves and they kind of taste I think actually they were in that salad that I made for you Tess I kind of add them wherever I'd add lettuce or rocket through pastas salads you know even just as a garnish on top they taste a bit like lemony Baby spinach leaves would be the closest thing I can. Mm. um, So the fact that we can eat both parts of the plant make it incredibly versatile. So that would be my number one pick if anyone only grows one. Probably why you now grow nasturtiums and nothing else on my (laughs) garden. (laughs) With the other ones, can you not eat the leaves or is it just they're not particularly tasty yeah good question i have no idea like i don't don't know if they're if they're yeah not edible or whether they're just terrible flavor or texture that we wouldn't want to eat them i'm actually not sure good question Hmm. so why do we grow edible flowers apart from eating them so like the herbs these actually attract heaps of beneficial insects and help control pests in the garden Obviously, the edible aspect is the first aspect, but there's actually just so many advantages above and beyond that. And remember in the herbs episode, the annual herbs, 
episode, we talked about companion planting and how some herbs mm. actually do a lot of benefit to our veggies and other plants in the garden. Well, it's exactly the same with edible flowers is a lot of them offer a lot of benefits above and beyond, you know, just their own produce. So nasturtiums are excellent to grow with cabbages and other brassicas because they can actually attract the white butterfly, the cabbage butterfly away from our brassicas to the nasturtiums, which, you know, (laughs) cabbage butterfly is a massive problem. So anything that's going to help with that is brilliant. They're really great grown underneath fruit trees. So if you've got an apple tree in the garden, you can grow nasturtiums underneath it and that will help control coddling moth from memory. They're also great with radishes and zucchini. This is not an exhaustive lift, by the way, but just examples of the way that we Mm. can kind of pair them in the garden. Now, marigolds are excellent grown with tomatoes. There's a particular pest, and it's skipped my memory now, but marigolds are excellent at repelling it, and that pest is particularly uh, keen on the old tomato. So given that tomato is something, you know, most of us will be growing, the fact that we can put a marigold in, which is edible and beautiful, and is going to actually help with our tomato production is just Tick, 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 win, win, win. Mm. So the same way as we do with the basil when we're companion planting with tomatoes, it's just like chuck a few around the bottom, like a bit of a scattergun type approach. You're exactly right. I grow my edible flowers exactly the same way I grow my annual herbs, and that is scattergun approach around the other crops. This is great for space saving, but it's also great for kind of, yeah, getting those benefits of the companion planting kind of around the crops that need it. So sure, you can have a whole garden bed that's just edible flowers, but I think that's probably not the best use of space nor the best use of the edible flowers benefits in the garden. So yeah, have your tomato Mm. plants and then dot your basil around like we talked about in the herb episode and dot a marigold or two around also. This will also attract bees into the garden. And we know we need the bees for much of the pollination of our fruit and veggies. So that's another great benefit that these edible flowers will have above and beyond their edibleness. Mm. They actually also have a lot of health benefits, edible flowers. I mean, you're not eating, you know, heaps of them. So it's probably going to be kind of negligible in your overall diet. But how they always talk about eating the rainbow because different colors are, you know, high in different nutrients or benefits it's the same with the edible Mm. flowers the the different colors actually have a lot that they can add to our diet and i mean let's just be very vain here they look very beautiful in the garden and and (laughs) and just you know make the whole thing well exactly i mean you know it's got to be beautiful and productive especially in winter like the winter vegetable garden looks a bit boring but there are uh, some of these flowers, in particular the calendula, pansies and violas that will flower right through winter. So that can make a huge difference to the aesthetics of the veggie patch in the cooler months. So are we growing from a seed or a seedling with our edible flowers? Well, of course we can do either. And with this list, heaps of them are available from nurseries as seedlings. So that makes a really easy option. But I will say that the best colors I think are often only available in seeds. So perhaps when you're starting, you'll take whatever uh, type of marigold or nasturtium they've got at the nursery in a seedling. But then over time, you might want to experiment and kind of diversify your color choices Cornflowers I really love and I don't often see them in seedlings. So I'd say they're the only ones you might have to get from seed, but they're quite easy to grow from seed. Mm. What I found with the nasturtiums is they're pretty prolific growers as well. So just, you know, everyone knows that I'm just a beginner. I would probably not bother with a seedling for a nasturtium, just go from seeds because they're they're good growers. Yeah, you're totally right. A nasturtium is literally a weed. So it's and it has <laughs> it's really easy to grow um very hard to kill and as you probably noticed when you planted them the seeds are huge they're like mm. they're like chickpeas almost so they're kind of an easy one to manage as a seed mm. are any of the other ones on your list quite as prolific growers as nasturtiums are I'd say nothing is quite like a nasturtium, but calendula can, uh, once it's going, it can be very prolific and will actually drop seeds and kind of self-seed all the time over your garden. So that Mm -hmm. one equally, I would say you probably don't need to buy the seedling. Uh, Seeds will do a good job and actually over time it'll come back on its own accord. But we will talk about that particular part of edible flowers later. 
So you've sold me on the edible plants. I love that you can, the edible flowers, I love that you can pop them in around what we've already got growing in the garden already. Is now the time to get them in? Yeah, it absolutely is. All the plants that I've listed in today's episode can all be planted in spring, which is fantastic. So any of them that take your fancy, get them in the ground now. But as I said, the calendula, the pansies and the violas are actually very happy to handle the cold and even can handle light frosts. So you can plant them throughout summer and autumn and then they'll continue to flower throughout winter. That's amazing. Oh, I love them. I've always got those three in the garden in the cooler months. Mm. So you can do them now and then you can kind of do them again in autumn for that winter bloom. Fabulous. So where are we going to be planting them? Well, the other great thing about some of these edible flowers I've mentioned, in particular the pansies and violas, is not only do they like the cooler weather, which is rare, they also are very happy in a lot of shade. So if there's a particularly shady part of your garden bed or garden that you know, you're not going to be able to grow a lot of the other edible crops, you can just tuck in a couple of these really pretty plants and they're going to be happy in that. Hmm. Maybe not full shade, but quite heavily part shaded. Pansies and violas are also quite small plants. So when you've got your veggie patch and you've kind of got everything in there already, you might have little pockets that that could need uh, or, you know, could afford some space or some color or whatever it is. So they're quite good ones to kind of just pop in around the place and they will bloom profusely on a really tiny plant. Like I'm talking like, you know, overhead, if you look down at it, maybe a 20 centimeter diameter is all the space that this pansy or viola is covering but on that it'll Mm. just be completely chockers with flowers like you won't even see a petal Uh, sorry you won't even see a leaf so you know they might be small but they're mighty another reason why we love them now nasturtiums prefer full sun but they will happily grow anywhere as you've already mentioned they are incredibly hardy and prolific and almost impossible to kill they and as you've also said they kind of trail as they're growing so this can be quite handy because what we can do is we can plant them in the corner of raised garden beds and they'll actually grow out and over the side and trail down so that is great use of space because kind of the side of your raised garden beds isn't getting a lot of action generally and also means that you know, it looks really pretty because you're covering up the side of the garden bed with a hanging plant. So that's usually how I plant the nasturtiums is kind of in the corner of raised garden beds. As I said, prefer full sun, but they will handle part shade. They just won't be as vigorous as the ones in the sun will be. And you can grow them in pots. In fact, you can grow everything I've mentioned in pots, probably except cornflowers I wouldn't grow in pots, but the rest of them, absolutely. You can have a windowsill, like a window box, in an apartment and Ah. you can put marigolds in it and they're going to do beautifully. So where would you grow cornflowers? In a garden bed, I would say. Maybe you can grow them in pots, but they grow about a metre tall, so they're not – the rest of the flowers are quite – they're quite small and compact, but the cornflowers, they're tall and skinny, so I think that look a bit weird in a pot. They're kind of better in like (laughs) – they're kind of better in like the back of a garden bed you know, adding some height to the back of things. But I don't know, if anyone grows cornflowers in pots, let me know. Now, marigolds, calendula and the cornflower prefer full sun. So Mm -hmm. that would be the kind of places you're going to put them. And again, you know, marigolds, you're going to plant with your tomatoes and your tomatoes want full sun. So it all kind of works together. Marigolds particularly work in very small pots. They're very compact plants if they need to be. So just to recap on that, so the cornflowers and the nasturtiums, they're quite, I mean, I know what a nasturtium looks like, but they're quite big and will need a bit more space than the compact ones are the pansies the marigolds and was there one other that was more compact uh pansies and violas okay with the cornflowers though they're actually not that big they're just tall and skinny so they kind of look like a pencil (laughs) so they actually (laughs) don't picture this at all (laughs) you know there's actually i grow them every year so i'm going to show you some of the photos that you will even seen of my garden or you have been in my garden and seen them you will have you will have noticed them often what people do is grow them in clumps so you might grow like 10 cornflowers really close together and then they kind of look like a bush but they're not a bush they're individual plants but the individual plant Mm. itself is actually very tall and skinny which is why i said it looks a bit weird in a pot like an umbrella. Like an umbrella? <laughs> I am even of... more lost now. Does it look like a corn plant? Is there any like, is there anything relationship in the corn name? I can't see one. 
or <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, so it doesn't look like corn. <laughs> no, and, you know, you mentioned cornflower blue and there are some incredibly beautiful blue cornflowers, but they also come in like pink and burgundy as well. Well, that's very confusing. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, it looks like photos of cornflowers are coming to the Instagram very soon. <laughs> Now, what I mentioned earlier, which you kind of touched on about the seed and the seedling, is like with my annual herb discussion, and I talked about this quite extensively when we talked about growing parsley, is these edible flowers will, if you let them, self-seed in the garden. So what that means is every spring, without kind of intending to or doing anything active at all, I always have nasturtiums and calendula popping up. These two seem to be the one that self-seed the happiest. Mm -hmm. Like with the herbs thing, if I'm going to have a weed, which is effectively a plant that's popped up uninvited, if I'm going to have a weed, which, you know, is inevitable in the garden, the fact that it can be an edible flower that's beautiful and productive is just the ultimate benefit. So I'm happy with that. I don't let them all grow because otherwise I would just have a garden of calendula and nasturtium. (laughs) But the ones that are in good positions, I leave there and then they come up on their own. In fact, it's got to the point now after growing edible flowers for so many years, and when I say so many years, like, I don't know, six years or something, then that self-seeding cycle is really strong. The only time I grow ones from seed kind of intentionally, so to speak, is when I want a particular color. So I saw Mm. some black nasturtiums, which they're not black, black, but they're kind of like a dark purple. I know. Nasturtiums are usually like in the yellow orange family, but this is like a, yeah, like a purpley burgundy color that I really liked. So I bought some of those seeds and I've grown them from seed. Same with the cornflowers. There was a type of cornflower that I'd never grown before. So I wanted to grow those because obviously I'm only going to be self-seeding plants that I've previously grown. So if I've grown a yellow Mm. nasturtium, then every year it's going to be a yellow nasturtium. That is kind of why I have planted some from seed in my greenhouse, not because I needed to, but because I wanted to. And the other good thing about this is kind of I grow them from seed in a punnet, just like uh, I think you did, Tess. Did you grow them in a punnet or you put them straight in the garden? No, direct sowed. Oh, look at you go. They (laughs) are. (laughs) I just like flung them around a little bit. Yeah. Well, Yes, actually, brilliant. I mean, especially with the nasturtiums, those big kind of chickpea seeds, you can absolutely just take a packet into the garden and fling them around and literally some will take. Like that's how good they are. Mm. So you don't need to be too fancy with it. The only reason I grow nasturtiums in punnets uh, and not direct so is because kind of at around this time, so this time being like right at the end of spring coming into summer, my garden is quite established as far as my tomatoes are in, my zucchinis are in, everything's happening. And then I can kind of look around and just say, oh, I've got a little hole there. I've got a little hole here. And then kind of mm. plug it with the edible flowers. So just to, like, cause I'm obsessed with using every square foot of space in that garden so then I could kind of add the edible flowers exactly where I want them that's the only reason why I bother to Mm. kind of grow them in a punnet. So we've got our edible flowers in is there anything that we need to be thinking about in terms of ongoing care? Look not really to be honest kind of like with the herbs they pretty much do themselves they there aren't a lot of pests that are interested in them which makes it really handy and because we've dotted them around in the rest of the garden bed There's plenty of nutrients in that soil because we fed our soil before we planted our tomatoes, for example. They're going to get watered because, you know, they're going to get watered when everything else gets watered. So actually there is Mm. zero attention that I give my edible flowers in and of themselves. Obviously, if you planted them in pots, you want to make sure that the potting mix was good in the pot beforehand. So so they do have Mm. food. Uh, and obviously keep the water up. But other than that, there's really nothing they need. The other thing is when we harvest them, which actually kind of comes into care and maintenance, is when you pick flowers, you actually encourage the plant to produce more flowers. So it's almost like Mm. the more blooms you want, the more you harvest. So when you're harvesting to add those edible flowers to your salad or to your dessert or whatever it is, that's actually encouraging the plant to continue blooming. Now, if you like my idea of this self-seeding weedy flower situation, let the flowers 
bloom and then actually as they kind of dry and wither and look shit that's when the seeds are kind of drying and forming so you want to allow the plant to get to that stage if you do not want to have any extra plants popping up that you didn't plant there yourself you want to cut off the flower heads when they're like dead and dying before they've fully dried out and then drop their seeds Mm. everywhere but other than that you're good to go with some of our other annuals that we've spoken about we know one of the signs that it's ready to come out is that it bolts is there an equivalent sign for edible flowers that they're they're done yeah good question because they don't bolt because they're already flowers in and of themselves Mm. a lot of them will just hang around for a really long time which is appealing i think the time the the thing you know when they're ready to come out is just they look terrible like the flowers yeah. are all dried and then the plant itself can often dry out, even not through lack of mm-hmm. water, but just from kind of, you know, it's going hard and fast and here for a good time, not a long time, <laughs> yeah. as you say. So I think if the plant is not aesthetically looking like it's best anymore, then that's the time to get it out. Okay. Is there anything else that we need to know about harvesting? Like do we just pick off the flowers? You literally just pick off the flowers. Some of them will close overnight or close once the sun goes down things like that so you could i mean so it's not the end of the world but if you want the flower looking it's best usually in the morning is the time people say to pick Mm -hmm. it but i mean we're getting way too nitty-gritty here i've never in my life been like (laughs) oh i want my calendulas for dinner tonight so i'll go pick them this morning um no and if you keep them in the fridge uh, just keep them kind of how you do in your salad greens in like a sealed plastic container mm-hmm. is going to keep them fresh. And you know, the other thing I'm going to go back on the benefits here is I, for work with food styling, right? We used to buy a lot of edible flowers for, you know, savory dishes, sweet dishes in particular. There's a lot of edible flowers we used to go through and they're not cheap to buy. Like you're talking like $8 mm. for a small punnet of violas. Oh yeah. And I mean, they're niche, right? They're fancy and you know, they're not the greatest market mm. for them. So it makes sense there's a bit of a price tag on them. But, I mean, goodness, I could buy a $3 viola seedling and have violas for, you know, 12 months of the year. So mm. it really is economical as well should you be in the edible flower market. And nothing prettier than a dessert, like whatever dessert you've made or whatever salad you've made, just as Tess said, just dump some edible flowers on it and it's going to take it from like a 50 to 100 just with that <laughs> quick sprinkle. So how else... We've talked about desserts, we've talked about salads, like what's some just like inspiration for everyone listening along of the best ways to use edible flowers? Yeah, I feel like just literally the the sprinkle on everything. I mean, people sometimes candy edible flowers. I've never done this. I don't even know how you do this, but oh. <laughs> I assume it's some kind of sugar coating of the, like especially with um, violas, you often see they've got that like white kind of frosting to them. That's the sugaring of the violas. But for me, I just think in their natural form, they look so pretty. One in particular that I think any parents listening might be particularly interested in is the cornflower. It's got these really tiny, delicate pink and blue petals on the flowers. And when you pick off the petal, I often don't use it as the whole flower. I pick off the individual petals and they almost look like confetti or sprinkles or I don't know, like ah, fairy how wings. How nice is that? It's really, really pretty. Fairy wings. <laughs> fairy wings. Listen to me. Who is this person? <laughs> so, you know, as... Like, how nice, like on top of cupcakes. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. Like mm. there's so many desserts I've made and then like, like and cakes and iced them and then sprinkled the petals over um, as that kind of confetti looking thing. So, you know, any way to get kind of move away from like, artificial colors and flavors at kids parties i mean i think the cornflower it does a better job yeah. and is mm. you know not just not bad for you but actually good for you so i think that one would i think deserves particular notice for its unique uh petals mm. we'll have to find another photo to put on the instagram of the the whole plant standing up tall like an umbrella <laughs> Don't know what that's going to look like. <laughs> and also the, the, the petals. I think we've got to find a photo also of a, like I cooked Christmas lunch uh, a couple of years ago for the family. And I think every single dish just had a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit over the top, actually, but I had fun with it. <laughs> oh, dear. So the big question Is the juice worth the squeeze? This is where we look at the effort-reward ratio of today's topic. The categories are 
Superstar, high effort, high reward. Completing this will make you feel like an absolute rock star. Best on ground, low effort, high reward. Quick wins and fill-ins, low effort, low reward. And finally, the wooden spoon, high effort, but not much reward. So tell me, Tess, where do we think the edible flowers are sitting on the squeezy juice matrix? For me, they're best on ground as, you know, a whole, as a group of plants. I think that, I mean, as I started by saying, to, to jazz up a simple salad and make turn it into something that's like really spectacular and it doesn't seem like they're that hard. Nasturtiums, dead easy to grow from my personal experience is that they just go gangbusters. What I'm interested in, in terms of squeezy juice, is like, what do you think are the slightly harder ones, like nasturtiums that we're putting in the easy bucket, and what are just like your favourites in terms of benefits either for flavour or for for looks? Yeah, good question. They are all really easy. I can't even – I mean, they're all so easy. But, yeah, I would say nasturtiums and calendula would be the ultimate of ease. So if you're going to go best on ground, those two are really going to deliver. And the fact that the calendula will flower and stay flowering just 12 months of the year, it's just makes it so 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 easy Mm. I would say the I mean I I just everything about the nasturtiums because the other thing is again we're going back to the benefits but I just love them is (laughs) as they kind of trail around the garden they create a living mulch so what you have is Ah. like yeah so you will have seen it on your garden beds I even saw it last uh, summer in your garden is like as they spread the actual root ball stays where it initially was planted it doesn't form roots it doesn't kind of walk and form roots like other plants like mint will right as mint spreads it's actually rooting when the nasturtiums spread around the garden they don't put any extra roots down so they're not competing with the zucchini that they're creeping up against Mm. they're forming a mulch over the soil which is going to do two things it's going to shade the soil which is going to prevent weeds from coming up and it's also going to keep the moisture in so we've got a living mulch that has all the benefits of mulch head back to the mulch episode if you need selling on (laughs) why mulch is amazing we've got the edible flowers the edible leaves the beneficial insects the controlling of pests i mean if i'm gonna say one plant that has to be best on ground is the old nasturtium Mm. the other thing that i really liked about it just in your list then is um, and not so much maybe for the nasturtiums but for the other ones we were talking about is just be able to chuck them in around whatever you've got going on as well like mm. utilising space, making the most of it and having those, you know, it is, I mean, except for all the benefits, you would say it's a quick win because you can just chuck it anywhere. Yeah, totally, totally. And look, the pansies, and I will say though, from a aesthetic perspective, the nasturtium is probably my least favourite of all these flowers, as great as they are. Like the pansies and violas, just having that flat surface I find kind of better for decorating like cakes or panna cottas mm. or desserts or something like that so they also have a special place in my heart one because I use them a lot two because they're so compact and three because they're flowering throughout winter mm. I suppose you know they've all got a special place in my heart <laughs> Rooting for You is hosted by Elise and Tess artwork by Lauren Janine you can find us on Instagram at Rooting for You Pod or email rootingforyou at elisealexandra.com. And remember, we are rooting for you.